Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video I am going to walk you through the process of valuing Vaxart stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Vaxart is a biotechnology company. It develops oral vaccines that can be stored and shipped without refrigeration, eliminating the need for needle injection. Its COVID-19 vaccine is the only oral vaccine with clinical data including T-cell and mucosal responses. If the company is able to get FDA approval for its COVID vaccine, then this will vaccinate 19 million Americans who do not want to get a vaccine administered by a needle. 70% of Americans prefer to take a pill instead of being injected by a needle. If all COVID vaccines were in pill form, then we could vaccinate the country a lot faster. It is faster because the pills can be mailed to each person's house instead of everyone having to set up an appointment. It is also cheaper because there is no need to pay medical staff to inject people. The following vaccines are in preclinical trial. HPV, RSV, that stands for respiratory syncytial virus, universal influenza, and quadrivalent seasonal flu. In phase one trials are one of its two COVID vaccines and its norovirus vaccine. Its other COVID-19 vaccine is in phase two. The drug furthest in the process is monivalent seasonal flu vaccine, which is at the end of phase two. A drug needs to pass three phases before it can be submitted to the FDA for approval. The first phase of the drug discovery process requires testing drugs on healthy people and also testing for safety, dosing, and side effects. The second phase requires testing on a larger group of people and testing for the efficacy of side effects. The third phase requires testing on a new and wide demographic as well as testing for long-term effectiveness and also comparing to other drugs. If a drug passes phase three, then it goes to the FDA for approval before it can be marketed and sold to patients. A low percentage of drugs receive FDA approval. You mean not good like one out of a hundred? I'd say more like one out of a million. So you're telling me there's a chance. Yeah! Even if a company gets one drug or vaccine approved, that can lead to significant revenue and profits. The company is headquartered in South San Francisco, California and was founded in 1969. It can be found on the NASDAQ, Mexican Bolsa, Deutsche Börse, and Zetra. It became a public company via a reverse merger. A reverse merger is when a private company becomes a public company by purchasing control of a public company. It is cheaper and quicker than going through the traditional IPO process. Let's get started with the model. This is a small cap company, 1 billion market cap. They're trading at 796 a share and they have 126 million shares outstanding. Let's look at their financials. Free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. And that's negative every single year. Net income is the profit or loss on the income statement. It's revenue minus expenses. That's also negative each year. Revenue is a sales for the company and that's really low. It peaked in 2019 at 10 million. It's currently 1 million. This is the company's income statement from 2018 through 930, 2021. The top line is the revenue, the sales. And you can see that's pretty low because they haven't gotten a vaccine approved at this point. It's mainly all service contracts and royalties. Below that is their operating expenses. A lot of that is research and development. And then their operating income, which is negative every single year. They spent 1.6 million of interest on their debt, which was the lowest amount in the past few years. And the bottom line of the income statement is their net income, which of course is negative every single year. This is their most recent income statement from the 10Q. This shows us the first nine months of 2020 versus the first nine months of 2021. And the top line is the revenue, the sales, it was 3.7 million last year, it's 800,000 this year. And a lot of their sales come from non-cash royalty related to sale of future royalties. 
And this goes back to one of their predecessor companies, Innovere. They received 20 million of royalty rights from this company, and that was initially booked as a liability. And each year they reduced part of that liability off of their balance sheet and passed through revenue onto their income statement. As you can see, it says that right here. We will continue to record revenue related to these royalties until the amount of the associated liability and the related interest is fully amortized. Then below that is their R&D expenses, which generally are the major expense for a biotech company, and then general and administrative expenses, like payroll, rent, or the miscellaneous expenses to run the business. So they have negative operating income every year, they don't have much debt on their balance sheet, so it looks like most of the interest expense is related to the royalty payments. Since they're not bringing in much revenue, they have a net loss in both periods. This is their statement of cash flows from 2018 to 930 2021. The top line is operating cash flow. That's how much cash the company loses from its operational business. You could think of operating cash flow as net income converted to cash because net income is your accounting profit or loss. It's not actual cash. They spent the most cash in the trailing 12 months, 55 million, because even though they haven't had a drug approved, it costs money to test drugs. They have to pay their staff to do the testing. They have to find people that are willing to do the testing and sometimes pay those people. They spent 5 million in CapEx in the trailing 12 months. This is investments in property, plant, and equipment. Operating cash flow minus CapEx gives you your free cash flow. Of course, they have negative free cash flow every year. They're pretty much running their business on equity. They raised 18 million in 2019, 111 million in 2020, and 127 million in the trailing 12 months. When a company issues common stock, that dilutes the current shareholders. But it's better to issue stock than debt when you have no cash flow coming in. Because if you issue debt, you have to pay the interest on your debt and then you go into more debt. When you issue stock, you don't have to pay a dividend, it's your option. This is their statement of cash flows from their most recent quarterly report. This is the first nine months of 2020 versus the first nine months of 2021. And the top part is operating cash flow. And the way you calculate CFO, you start with your net loss, and then you have to add or subtract the non-cash items on the income statement, and then adjust for changes in working capital. They pass through a loss of 50 million. And then we have to add back depreciation of 3 million, 6 million of stock-based compensation, and then non-cash interest expense related to the royalties, that's 1.1 million. And we have to minus out non-cash revenue related to the royalties. All the money from these royalties was received back in 2016. They put all that cash onto their balance sheet, but over time they're amortizing those dollar amounts from their balance sheet onto their income statement. They had a cash outflow of 3.6 million in prepaid expenses. A prepaid expense is when a business makes an advance payment for a product or service that's going to be received in the future. When they initially make the payment, it's a cash outflow and it's put onto their balance sheet. But when the company uses the product or service, it's taken off the balance sheet and it's a cash inflow. An example is if you pay 12 months of your rent upfront, Initially, it's a cash outflow of 12 months, but every month in the future for the next 12 months, you're getting to use your property rent-free. It's not really rent-free because you pay for it in the past, but in that particular month, it's a cash inflow because you don't spend any cash. It's an accounting cash inflow. You don't actually get cash. You just get use of your property without spending cash. In this company situation, this represents unbilled receivables where revenue has been recognized in advance of the customer getting billed. Even though they reported a loss of 50 million, their cash outflow was 44 million. The next part of the statement of cash flows is cash flow from investing. And that starts with investments in property, plant, and equipment. That was 4.1 million. They purchased 41 million of short-term investments. Instead of keeping cash in a savings account and getting no interest, companies usually buy short-term investments to get a better return on their investment, but keep the cash liquid and safe. And they received four and a half million for maturity of their short-term investments. So in the investing section, they had a cash outflow of $41 million. In the financing section, they had 122 million cash inflow from an at-the-market offering. A company can usually do an at-the-market offering whenever they want, 
they're just issuing more common stock into the open market at the current market price. This of course dilutes the current shareholders. But a company doesn't want to offer too many shares at once because the stock price can go down a lot if they start diluting the shareholders a ton. So they may want to do a little bit at a time. And if they wanted to issue say 10 million shares, if they did it all at once, maybe the first million shares they would get more money than the last million shares because the stock price will go down as they're issuing more shares into the market. But if they did a million a week over 10 weeks, then the stock price wouldn't move nearly as much. A company usually has to pay a bank a 3% fee for helping them do an at-the-market offering. They received 1.8 million from issuing warrants. Warrants are long-dated options. And they received 1.2 million from the exercise of options. So in the financing section, they had a cash inflow of 125 million. This is the equity section of their 930 2021 balance sheet and they have 205 million of equity. They raised 404 million from selling their business and they lost 199 million from running their business. When you see common stock in the equity section, it's not the actual value of the stock. Every share of stock is assigned a par value. It's an arbitrary number. It's usually a penny. In this case, it's 0 0.0001 cents. It's just a way to track the number of shares in the market. So they have about 236 million shares outstanding. This 125 million and this 110 million. And if you sum up these two numbers and multiply by 0 0.0001 cents, that comes out to about $13,000. And the way additional paid in capital is calculated it's the money the company received from selling their common stock into the market minus this $13,000. Let's look at their capital structure. They have 205 million of equity, 13 million of debt. They're 94% equity, 6% debt. And their net debt is negative 175 million because they have a lot of cash on that balance sheet from all the capital raises. In most of my videos, I usually try to value the company by estimating the future free cash flows and then discounting that back to today's value. But it would just be a total guess because I don't know if they're gonna get vaccines approved or not and how many they'll get approved. I'll just show you what other analysts say. Simply Wall Street values the company at 117 a share. They're saying it's extremely overvalued. Four analysts priced this stock and the average price target was $13. The low was nine, the high was 18. This is where the stock has been trading the last two years. Whenever the company announces a drug has passed a phase in the clinical trials, the stock price usually goes up. At this point, they're not bringing in much revenue. The stock price moves on the hopes the company will get closer to FDA approval for one of its vaccines. You can see on this day, there was a lot of action. The stock price got way up to $25 on the intraday. It looks like it opened at about $13 and closed at about $7.50. But at one point during the day, the stock price got up to $25. This could have been a short squeeze. And when you see green down here, that means there was a lot of buy orders. So that means the stock price went up. When there's a lot of red, there's a lot of sell orders and the stock price goes down. And the higher the bar is down here, the more buy or sell orders on that particular day. The stock price is up a ton from two years ago. It was really low. It looks like the type of stock a swing trader could have made a lot of money on. And it has a really low beta, 0.35, so the stock moves one third the market. It's gone up 4% in the past 52 weeks while the S&P is up 27%. Its 52 week low was $5, its high was 25, and it is trading above its 50 day and 200 day moving average. In the past three months, on average, three and a half million shares were traded each day on this stock. Of the 126 million shares outstanding, 125 million are on float, 39% are held by institutions, and it has a really high short percentage, over 16% of the shares on float are shorted. Their employee count was up to 35 in 2019. Then they cut it in 2020, possibly due to coronavirus, but it has come up. They're currently at 28 workers. If you put $10,000 into this company 10 years ago, you would have quadrupled your money after a couple of years. But if you're still holding on, you'd be down to about $5,000 today. That's a 50% loss. State Street is their biggest shareholder at 7%, then BlackRock, Vanguard, Geode, and Northern Trust. 
Let's look at their financial ratios. They have negative net income, so we can't look at the PE. They bring in hardly any sales, so they have a terrible price to sales ratio. They have a good price to book due to all that cash they raise from selling stock. They have a really high current ratio and quick ratio. They have 187 million of cash and short-term investments on their balance sheet. It does look like they have enough cash to get through the next two or three years. Their free cash flow in the trailing 12 months was negative 60 million and they have 180 million of working capital. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. So they have $120 million of funding. The best way to look at ratios to compare them to companies in the same industry. I've done videos of 18 companies in the same industry as Vaxart. And Vaxart doesn't have good ratios since they're pretty much pre-revenue. They have a terrible price of sales, a good price to book. They do have a really high current ratio. They have a negative ROE. The average in the industry is actually worse, negative 37%. They're low in debt, and they're a small company, one billion market cap. So to summarize, it's really hard to identify whether this stock is a buy or not. It all depends on if any of their vaccines get approved. And COVID doesn't seem to be going away, so there's a lot of opportunity for this company to make money during this difficult time. So going through their financials may seem futile. It's probably more of an educational exercise at this point. Since they're not really bringing in much revenue, they're losing a lot of money each year. But that's to be expected for a company that hasn't had a product that's been FDA approved at this point. But at this point, it seems like they're doing all the right things. They're trying to move forward with the approval process. And it seems like they have sufficient funding to continue. So it's really a waiting game for us to find out if they continue moving forward with the process. I rank their free cash flows, revenue, and ratios 1 out of 10. So let me know what you think. Give this video a like, subscribe, or comment below. Also, if you'd like to get a custom valuation or just support the channel, you can become a member by clicking on the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.